talk to talk about um, our missionary effort throughout the the years that I've been here because I believe that our missions effort has helped to define who we are as a church. I remember when Doug Eccles first came, it was actually by mistake. He knew Jerry Denton. Jerry Denton was down in Delaware. He tried to make contact with him and um, they could never connect. But Jerry did recommend church assembly. And so Doug came on a Wednesday night Bible study and um, it was a powerful service. And it was through Doug that we started to get involved in missions because Doug was a missionary evangelist. And he was going to different nations of the world and bringing the gospel. And kind of in the beginning of his ministry, and so that was just happening for him. When we found out that he was going to um, South American countries, because we had so many Spanish-speaking people here, we said, we'd like to go with you. And so that started the ball rolling and we went to Honduras and experienced an amazing move of God. And we saw God move through that team that went. And um, that got us started. And, and I don't know what year that was, but many years ago. And each year then we started going to a different country, bringing different teams from church. And as we did, there was a fire that was lit in the hearts of the people. As we went out and shared some for the very first time that they've ever gone and spoke about their testimony. But the team went, they shared their testimony, and they saw what kind of effect it had on the, the people that wanted to see and what it did for them as, as they went. So I want to talk about that, okay, today. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, it says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And many years ago, we determined as a church that our church was going to be based on what Jesus came to do. We felt as so though there were three segments of that. And so we made it as a part of our mission statement. First of all, we love God. Everybody say, love God. That was first and foremost what we felt as though we had been called to do, to express our love for God in as many ways as we can. And worship was became a, a very big, or was even before we decided this, it was a big part of our Sunday experience. And so we worship, we spend time in the presence of God, and um, we had some tremendous times in the Lord. The second was that we should love each other. We determined that if people are going to come into our church and there are going to be walls around us, then people are not going to be welcome. We can't love the world if we don't love each other. And so we determined back then that the second most important thing for this church to do was to love one another. To create that family atmosphere where our friendship with each other, our family uh, relationship with each other would grow stronger and stronger. And that we, uh, as people come in, that they would know that this is a place where they can, they can rest. And then the third thing is that we would love the world. That we would love outside the world. 
We say it's not enough to love God. It's not enough that we love one another. But we have to include a love for the lost world. And that started, that started as we went outside the, do the doors of the church. Loving the world means outreach to, to our world, but it also takes us beyond the seas, takes us to the world that we've never been to before, to bring the gospel. And so we, that became the definition of Cheshire Assembly. We felt that that would be balanced. We thought it would, it would help us to grow. And so we've lived by that for years and years now. Um, way back in the old church, we determined that that was going to be our mission. Our mission was to love God, to love each other, and to love the world. But when we started going with Doug, our love for the world became even greater. We, we came to understand that the love that, that we had for the lost world would have to be a driver for us to push us to, that we would, we would continue to go on. And so, uh, it's important for, it was, we said it was important for us not to delete any one of those three areas. Don't leave anything out. And as we built upon that mission statement, God's blessing was here. And we saw growth, we saw a passion, and we had a purpose. We didn't just come together and say, oh, okay, well, let's have church today. No, we said there is a purpose for Chestnut Assembly. There's a purpose for me, you, to be a part of, the, of that kind of a church. That would be the church that Jesus came to build. And I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against him. So as we adopted that, it, made, it gave us a purpose. We met with a purpose. We reached out with a purpose. We had fellowship for a purpose. And that has sustained us down through the years. Today, I would like to, I would like to look back at how we have attempted to show our lost world through missions and through outreach that God lives in our heart. So let's do it. In your notes, it says, I'd look at the effects of our mission effort over the years. They have had tremendous impact on nations we have visited and had opportunity to bless over the years. Churches have been started and, and strengthened because of the effort that was set forth. As we look back, we'd go, when we went to the very rich nations on that weekend, we would all separate ourselves and go to a local church. And so uh, we had opportunity to meet the people and to have interaction with the people. As we developed that, not only did we have a crusade with Brother Eccles, and those crusades were amazing. People were touched, healed, delivered, saved. And we saw what was happening, and we knew that it was because we answered the call to go. People were being saved and healed and delivered because we said yes. And so as we answered that call, I believe it was one of the de de defining factors of Chestnut Assembly of God. Long before it was a popular thing to do. Now I hear about churches going on mission trips all the time. But back then, I had not heard about it much at all and so we kind of broke ground and I hope that we became a a um, 
they help Father Church to go out and, and do the work of the gospel and take us to places that we never would have gone before. We started church. When I was in India, um, I was going with Ed Nelson, who had to back out the last minute because his brother had passed away. And so I was going to India, and I knew very little. I was depending on Ed Nelson. And so when we went out, first thing I saw was in near the place where we stayed, there was a well. The whole city that we were in drank from that well. Every day they would go to that well and they would fill buckets of water, filled with fresh water. And I inquired about that well because we had never been there before. I, then I found out that it was a well that we had contributed to from somebody else that went. They came to us and we, we took an offering to help build that well in India. And every day when I was there, now this is long after the wall had been drilled, every day people would line up with their buckets, get fresh water to take home. And then I realized, wow, we have an impact on people far, far away. They knew that it was because of a Christian ministry that was in that town with Brother Ulupan, they knew and they associated and many people, because they had no place else to get fresh, fresh water, it was the only well in the whole city. And so it was a testament of what Christians do in love for others as we spend ourselves, spend our, our money, our time, our effort to reach out and uh, get things started. When I was in India, I went and spoke at a village that had never heard the gospel of Jesus. They had never heard the name of Jesus. So on that trip to India, I went alone. I didn't have a team here because it was so far away and so costly. And um, they set up ch Chinese lanterns with a generator in this village. They had no electricity. And so I went and I preached the gospel that night. At the end of my message, I invited anybody that wanted to accept Christ. You know, in India, they have many gods. You look around you and everything is a God. Well, it was a challenge for me to preach to them and let them know there was one God and his name was Jesus. And to make as clear as I could to a group of people that believed in a thousand gods. But at the end of that message, I invited those that wanted to accept Christ as a Savior. Hands went up. I think about eight people gave their heart to the Lord that, that night. And it was a, a, a great night. But, and, um, and so afterwards, I asked, I asked the people that were there, Dr. Wilpon, I asked him, how come? How come they, after hearing one message, they accept Christ as a savior. What do they know? He said, they don't know anything. And they don't understand what you're talking about. But he said, the spirit of God was at that place and he enlightened their heart and they took the first step and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He could save he said, now we will go back and we will start to disciple these people and we'll start a church. With these eight people, we'll start a church. And um, so today, there is, a, there is a church in that village and people are getting saved 
years later, because of the involvement that we had as a, as a people. And so the impact of this church in a, in a faraway place like India is a tremendous thing. And it's something that, that we can, I'm going to say, be proud of, not proud, proud, but be thankful to, for God, for enabling us to have that vision to reach out and to make sure that the world knows that, that God loves them. Um, Um, as we as we went with Doug year after year, we started to understand what this was all about. And we started to get into it. And when we went to the crusade, there were many people that were saved. Thousands came to the crusade. And, and, and they came searching. And God moved. And our people were, were very moved up. Let me say that that um, even though we have gone out to do mission trips, it's so important for us to understand that no matter how many mission trips we will take, we'll, ne we'll never take the place of a career missionary because they go and they stay in the assemblies of God they stay four years and then they have to come back to America for one year but then they go out every four years and they they disciple they do Bible studies they do Bible schools they build churches and so our career missionaries you can't replace that with a mission trip. And so, and so I, I want to emphasize that by supporting career missionaries, and we, we do every month, we, in October we have a, a mission convention. We raise money for the whole year, and then the whole year we, we send money. We send... Um, about $3,000 a month to support career missionaries so that they can go out and do the thing that God has called them to do. And we should never, ever think that a week-long missionary effort will ever take the place of a career missionary. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And so Jesus was, was setting out to reach the people. But before he went, he sent teams of people out, these 70 people, and, and they would go into every city that Jesus was going to go to. They would do the, the advanced work. They would prepare the place to receive the gospel that Jesus would come and preach. It was a tremendous thing. They had never done this before. But it was amazing that, that as, they, as they went out. And it was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of, of wolves. Skip down to verse 17. It says, The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And so this definitely was a mission effort. Jesus was going to be going to these various cities. He was going to preach the kingdom of heaven. He was going to establish the, the gospel. But before he went, 
he sent these 70 of his followers and they went ahead of him and started praying for people. They laid hands on them. They started doing the work of, of the gospel. Isn't it interesting that they didn't, they didn't just go to these cities and say, hey, everybody, Jesus is going to be coming in, in, in a couple of weeks. And I want, you, I want you to hear what he has to say. They did not do that. They weren't just, they weren't there just to announce that Jesus was coming and he was going to teach them and he was going to perform miracles. The seventy realized that the Spirit of God was on them and they went and preparing the way by laying hands on the sick, by casting out demons, by establishing the gospel themselves. Regular people, just like you. But it realized that the Spirit of God was on them. Seventy people that were empowered by the Holy Spirit they realized that they had a gift that God had given to them and they made a difference. So the 70 went out and they started doing the work of the gospel. We saw over the course of years and years of going that people who had never given their testimony before People who had never prayed for, for anybody before laid hands on them. As they went to Honduras, Ecuador, as they went to Peru and Guatemala, Nicaragua, so many different places. They said, let's not wait until Doug Eccles has a, has a crusade. We're going. We have power. And so um, some of you would go and do the work of the gospel and would come away saying the same thing that the 70 said. Wow, look what God has done. And would come back from our mission trips and would say, I can't believe it. And they came here and they shared the, the, the testimony of how God moved on them, the Holy Spirit moved on them. And they told you their stories of how, of how they touched people with the love of Christ and saw people get saved and healed and deliverance. Some had never, had never been used to drive a demon out of an individual. They saw it for the first time. The eyes were like saucers when the demon would start to manifest himself. But we taught them ahead of time that you have more power in you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so they came back like these 70 did. And they said, wow, even the, the demons are subject to to the gospel. And so as we lifted up the name of Jesus, went to these different countries with a simple gospel, but in the power of the, of the name of Jesus, we saw things happen. We saw great and mighty things happen. And so we were able to make an impact in Honduras, Ecuador, Nicaragua, Colombia, Peru, Guatemala, Argentina, Mexico, Zambia, Ukraine, India, and Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. We were in, Hon we were in um, Peru twice. We were in Colombia more than once. We were in Guatemala a number of times. We're in um, Zambia about five times, and um, Haiti, we've been there a number, many times. And so, 
for a local church to have this kind of a vision, world vision, was amazing. And it brought life to those that went. God bless them in a main way for raising the money. They raised their own money for the, for the um, mission trip. Some of them would come and sell a cake and cupcakes and stuff. Some of them would, um, we had many creative ideas and um, it was a powerful thing. We can in no way measure the impact that was made on these locations. There's no way that we can measure the impact that we had on pastors, on churches, on communities. Um, what we were not ready for was the impact it would have on those that went. We weren't ready for that because we found out that for those that went, it would have an unbelievable impact. For so many that went, it was a life-changing experience. We thought that by going, we we're going to bring a blessing to the people that, that came to us, that we were able to reach out to. But in going, God honored us as we stepped out of our comfort zone. People that were scared spitless to do what they were doing. They had no idea what kind of impact we would have. But we learned this fact. It is better to give than to receive. And there were many that went that had absolute life-changing experiences. They will never be the same. I've been using my time recently to talk about different places that we've been. I was with a small group of people, uh, some of who had gone, and they, they said, Pastor, my life will never be the same. Will never be the same. I never experienced anything like when I was obedient to God. I stepped out of my comfort zone. I paid the price. I've had a life-changing -ch experience. God has changed my life because I, I stepped out and, and was obedient to Him. They said, I will never be the same. Some who went with us years ago are still saying, the impact of my going to a mission field is still affecting my life today. And so um, I encourage you as we continue to do this and reach out, we're, we're, we're going to establish a church in Guatemala. Well, I'm going to tell that story. We have had three mission directors over the, over the years. We started out with, with, with uh, Lewis and Lillian Fuentes. Uh, I'm telling you, they were amazing because Lewis was able to interpret for Doug. God really used him in a tremendous way. Those are the, were the days that we went to, like uh, Honduras and Guatemala, and, and um, not Peru, but Nicaragua, Colombia. They were the mission. They were the mission directors, and they they loved what they did. They loved seeing life change with the gospel. And then they passed the baton on to, on to um, Paul Baker. Paul Baker served as a mission director. He did a marvelous job. 
organizing, group scoring, and preparing the way, staying in touch with Doug Eccles, taking care of details. Paul had a passion. He had a passion for the lost people. And um, I know, I know if you'd ask Paul Baker what, in, what kind of impact that being the mission director had on him, he would not be the man that he, that he is. He experienced great things. And then Paul handed the baton over to D. Ferrari. And for the last couple, two or three years now, D. has been the mission director and she got a taste of missions. Once you get bit by the bug, you don't want to do anything else. And so she has been a fantastic uh, mission director and is taking us forward. We thank God for that. Let me just give you a couple of highlights, okay? One was, the first one was to Honduras. You know, the first one is the, is the one that carries so many memories. Any, anything you do for the first time, it, has, it makes an impact. And so Honduras was our first love. And it was also the most difficult one in, in some ways because they had just had a, they had just had a hurricane that decimated the country. And so we were following on the heels of a, a hurricane. Now, as you fly into Honduras, the capital city is Tegucigalpa, and it has mountains all around it. And so the airport is in the middle of the city, but it's not like they can start declining long before they land. They have to almost get over on top of the city, and they have to circle the airplane. And each time they circle, they would go down lower. And, and then when it came, came time to land, they would have to swoop down from where they were and swoop down and into the airport. Well, if you know that's what's happening, then that's, that's good. But if you don't know what's happening, that would be pretty scary. <laughs> and so uh, when we saw that, it was a, a frightening experience for us. But we landed and got on a bus and went down to the city that we were going to minister. And um, the bus ride was uh, a few hours away. And like I said before, the bridge, bridges were washed away by the hurricane. And so we'd go down, get into the river, cross the river in the river, and then go up the bank again. Um, I remember one bus ride we took. It was on the side of a mountain, and and somehow they, they cut the road out of the mountain. And so when you're riding, you look out one side, you can't see anything. All you can see is a cliff. And so they had, they had not put any guardrails up yet. And so I looked around the bus and saw all our, uh, people, and they were kind of looking, their eyes were like saucers as they looked out the window. And um, fortunately, the bus driver knew what he was doing. We got to a place where we had the crusade. It was a citywide crusade. One night the mayor came and he gave his heart to the Lord that night. He reached into his pocket, he bought a pack of cigarettes and threw them on the altar. And the crowd went wild. We had about 5,000 people in the crowd that, for that crusade but we made an impact on the city. 
And it was amazing. The hotel we stayed at, they forgot to leave the lights on for us. That's because they didn't have lights. <laughs> I remember that two of the guys that roomed together was Rhonda Galena and Ruben Bermudez, the former mayor. And so they, it was like um, the odd couple because cause, um, Ruben is a, was um, a stickler for having a nice tie on, dressing well, and, and Ron is just a regular guy. And so it, we made fun of that the whole time. One day we got up and, and um, the, the girls on the trip were kind of came to breakfast um, laughing. They told us a story of how one of them was washing her hair in the sink. And while she was doing that, the sink came off the wall. The plumbing stayed, but the sink came off the wall. So here she is holding the sink with her hands and trying to figure out what to do. And so that was a, a powerful thing. Um, it was there that Ray Mor Morales, you remember Ray, he has passed on now, but Ray, uh, he was very serious when he did this, but he came to me and said, Pastor, I want to adopt a child here. I said, Ray, you're not a young man. What do you, what do you, what do you mean? He said, Pastor, I can't go home. <laughs> you can't go home and leave these kids here. His heart was so touched. He said, I'm going to start procedures to come back and get a child and bring it back with us. Well, uh, that was the kind of impact that being on a mission field had. We discovered that no matter, whenever you went on a mission trip, you'd leave a piece of your heart with them. Always leave a piece of their heart. You'd always be giving yourself away. And so for me, it means that I have so many pieces of my heart in, in these different countries because you don't want to leave them, but you don't want to come home. And so Ray was very passionate about that and, and wanted to adopt. It was amazing. Another place we went was Peru. Peru was interesting because we went to Puno, and Puno is 13,000 feet in the air above sea level. And so um, Pikes Peak, I think, is 9,000. And so this, this was high. And so it was made it so difficult breathing because the air was so thin and we could feel it the minute we stepped off the plane. And um, we went to a hotel. And in the hotel, my room was on the fifth floor of the hotel. And there was no elevator. Now, for me to walk up five floors anyway would be difficult. But when the air is so thin, you walk up three steps and you have to catch your breath. And so that first night I had them move me on the first floor. And um, who knows, uh, cool weather, 
friendly people. And um, we had a crusade in, in, in Peru, in Puno. I remember there was some people were getting sick because of, of the air. And they had a tea for us to drink to help us. I was going to preach at the main church on that Sunday morning. And so we had to walk from our hotel down to where the church was. It wasn't that far. Well, it was turning to get to me. And I started getting lightheaded. And I felt my head fill up. And I, I could hardly talk. I said, Lord, I have to preach today. And uh, I'm not, I'm feeling worse by the minute. And so I'm sitting there in the fir- on the front view. They had a worship band at the church. They had great worship. And so I knew how I was feeling. I said, there's no way I can preach feeling this way. And so I determined that I was going to worship God with all my heart. I pushed, pushed, and I said, I'm going to, I stood up on my feet. I started walking around. I started praising God. By the time it came, time for preach, I was feeling fine. I preached that message, and um, the, uh, the blessed by by the Holy Spirit, and um, there was such an impact in Puno, Peru, that that when we got home, Paul Baker and um, Rolando and a couple of the others said, we want to go back. And I I didn't feel led to go back, but they put together a second trip to, to Puno, Peru, and um, and had another great time, and so we ministered there in a very powerful way. The other time we went to Peru was down south. We went to, flew into Lima, and then we got on a plane, went all the way to the south of Peru, got off the plane, got into a boat, and the boat went up the Amazon River. We had six hours in that boat going up the Amazon. The Amazon was not clean. As we were going up, we could see the every every town would pour its uh, refuge into the into the river, and so it was messy. It was terrible. We got to where we're going in Reno. And um, we had a marvelous service. I we had a we had a pastors conference. People came down the river hours to get to the pastors conference. I happened to be doing the pastors conference, and it was amazing. The spirit of God descended on, upon the pastors and their wives that were there. We prayed for them. And God moved in an absolutely marvelous way. I had couples that we prayed for. And they just started to weep. The whole pastor's conference was uh, amazing because of what the Holy Spirit did. And the pastors were encouraged. They would go back to their village, their river village, with a new fresh call, preach the gospel. It was an amazing time. I don't have, I just remembered, I don't have the Philippines on here, but I went to the Philippines because Jesse and John Buckman had invited us to go. <clears throat> I went, Marilyn and I went alone. 
with them. <clears throat> but one of the times we, I was meeting with all the pastors, and we're having lunch. So after lunch, I wanted to pray for them, one by one. And so as I, I prayed for them, the Spirit of God fell. I gave them a word. I saw the reaction, tears going down. I felt like Russ, Russ Moyer. Because I, as I was speak the word, it was touching their hearts. As I was, as I was speaking the word, the Holy Spirit was touching their hearts, and it was an um, amazing thing. Um. Guatemala with the kitchen of love, Zambia with Bishop Peter, who went back five or six times, and um, that was the, so many experiences is impossible. No. And then Haiti, a church on the hill, building a church across the seas, not an easy thing. Because communication, but in time, we were able to build a church and build a school. And today, the, having a church in in that building today, the spirit of God is falling. People are being blessed, and a witness is, is taking place. And so. We carry with us the many, many, many memories of how God used our team, blessed the team. My recent trips, have, uh, it's not because of me. You know, I can hardly get out of the hotel. But the team that goes and ministers in the power of the Holy Spirit this church sends its teams. This church sent a team to Columbia in Cali. This church has sent so many teams and many have gone and many have sent. You as a church have sent them out and so there are churches that are, have been strengthened and there are churches that have been stirred because of the missions and never Because Chester Assembly said, we want to love the world. We want to show our love. We don't want to just talk about our love. We want to act on our love. And so the next time there's a mission trip in July, uh, back to Haiti again, and others that will, I encourage you to either go or send. Help those that God speaks to about going. This July, we're going to be doing a BBS for children with our school, and we're believing for great, great things. These kids will never forget the group that came from America, and we gave them food, and we ministered to them. They will grow up remembering about that group of people because you sent them, because you went because you allowed God to use you in reaching the world for Jesus. Amen? Let's stand. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward.
What is God, what is God speaking to you about today? Does God want you to get out of your comfort zone? Is God calling you to be a team, a part of a team that will reach out around the world? I didn't even get a chance to talk about the local outreach that we do. But as we we're coming back from Guatemala, there was a ministry there called the Kitchen of Love. And as I'm coming back on the plane, the Lord was speaking to me, because I wanted to do more in Guatemala. I wanted to do more. I wanted to go back and get involved and build a church there in Guatemala, near Guatemala City. And the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, don't do in Guatemala what you are not willing to do in Vanden. And I came home and I told the staff that I was staffing what God spoke to me. And I, I didn't get the words out of my mouth when Pastor Tony raised his hand and said, I want to be in charge of that. I want to do that. And God ignited something in his heart. That man has a... Has a a heart for need, needy people. And so from that came the Dream Center and reaching out, adopt a block and all that. Don't do in these faraway places what we're not willing to do here. There are needs right outside our door. And if we will answer the call, if we'll love the world like he loves the world, we'll continue to make an impact on our city. And we'll continue to reach out to the poor and to the needy. And God will continue to flow through this church in the years ahead as we develop a heart of love and care for lost people. Be a part of that team. You, be a part of that team. Be a part of that outreach. You, ask God to give your heart for the people that, that are needy. And God will use you in a great and mighty way. We have a prayer team for those that want prayer or want to join with someone with prayer. And if you're willing to will give yourself away, make that commitment today. Father, we stand here today, we are so grateful as we think of the past years, how you have used us in, in such a powerful way to reach so many people, thousands of, of people, one night in Africa, there were 10,000 people. And we prayed for them. And you moved in a mighty way. So help us to be a part of the outreach of this church. Giving ourselves away. Giving ourselves away giving ourselves away. Ignite our heart, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.